Okay, this is <clears throat> session eight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word, and we ask you to release that spirit of revelation in the name of Jesus. Let the spirit of revelation awaken the heart. Come and awaken our hearts, O Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Good session eight. We're talking again about the spirit of might, the beauty of God's sovereignty, the beauty of God's sovereignty. That, again, is one of the principal things that fueled David's courage was his revelation of the sovereignty of God. It caused his heart to be steadfast. In the, in the last session, one of the main things that we have to really settle is the issue of despair. Because when despair gets on us, when the spirit of despair lays hold of us, it really, really takes the life out of us. I was just talking to someone uh, at, at the break and they were saying, I don't know what to do. And I says, you know what? You really do know what to do. What to do is not the confusing part. It, typically, that's our immediate response is, I don't know what to do. What to do is so simple. There's no mystery in what to do. It's, it's the doing of it. But the thing that hinders us in the doing of it is the spirit of despair. Meaning, there was a time in my life, I don't mean one day, but one season. And maybe that season takes a while, but when it connected with me, when I said, why can't I do this? When I personalized it inside and said, why can't I be a lover of God? And, and, and to confess that, to identify yourself in that light breaks off a spirit of despair. There's a spirit of despair militating against you connecting with yourself as a lover of God. We get so accustomed to failure, so accustomed to boredom, so accustomed to barrenness, we define ourselves that way. And it's that definition, it's that spirit of despair that keeps us defining ourselves as one that will never change. That is the enemy right there. And I was speaking to this person, I said, you know what? What to do is not that confusing. It's when the state goes in the ground. I don't mean you make a commitment. It's a little different than making a commitment. Commitment's very important. It's when you see yourself as one that really can flow in this. When you begin to believe that, that's when the difference takes place. Most believers define themselves as hopeless hypocrites. When you begin to find your, define yourself, even in your struggle, you define yourself as a lover of God who struggles, as a lover of God who struggles with sin, instead of as a sinner who struggles to love. Most believers say, I'm just a sinner. I'm a hopeless hypocrite that struggles to love God, and they stay earthbound. But there's a time in the life of a fervent believer when they say in their same struggle, they said, I'm not a hopeless hypocrite condemned to barrenness because I struggle in love. No, 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 that's not me. It is true I struggle. That's not true. That's not the truth of who I am. I am a lover of God, made to worship, made to be abandoned, and I do struggle with sin. When that definition lays hold of our hearts, I'm telling you, that's when the stake goes in the ground, and that's when the fog, little by little, begins to lift from our eyes, what to do is not really, really the problem, but that's where most people that's where most people focus on making the change. They don't know what to do. No, it's how they define themselves. There was a time when I said, I will be a lover of God. That really felt good. Then there was another step up. I said, I am a lover of God. I just struggle with sin right now. But the essence of who I am, I am an abandoned, committed man of God. I'm just struggling. When I begin to define myself, first I define myself as a hopeless hypocrite that would never change. Then I define myself, I will change one day. I begin that dawn, that light of faith begin to dawn on my heart. Then I went the next step. I am a lover of God. I am a man on the way to abandonment. That's who I am. That's how I'm going to present myself. That's how I'm going to think of myself. That's how I'm going to approach God in prayer. That's how I'm going to uh, think of myself uh, in my private life. That's how I'm going to interact with people. Yeah, I struggle, but I'm an abandoned man of God. In Psalm 2, let's look at Psalm 2. We're going to have to turn this up a little bit. We're just going to go right with it. we got a hell storm going here, but we're just going to... Louder. Psalm 2, 
Psalm 2, David has a, a supernatural revelation into the, the, the uh, sovereignty of God in God's end time purpose and God's end time plan. I want to give you three psalms that I want you to put together. And I believe that these three psalms are the type of revelation that was fueling David's heart. They were the type of revelation that was fueling David's heart. Psalm 2, Psalm 24, and Psalm 110. I want to give you those three psalms again. Psalm 2, Psalm 24, and Psalm 110. In those three psalms, David, by the Holy Spirit, is taken, if you will, out of time, and he gazes on the unfolding of God's majesty with his Son Christ Jesus in the eternal courts. Those three psalms will bring you to where I believe David was living when he confronted Goliath. I'm not saying that he wrote those three psalms, in his youth, I'm saying that those revelations were beginning to really fuel and motivate David's heart. The Holy Spirit pulls back the veil. And David begins to interpret natural history. He begins to see the unfolding of where God is taking history by the Spirit of Revelation. These are very, very unique three psalms in terms of the sovereignty of God. Psalm 2, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of it. There's four sections, four different sections of Psalm chapter 2. Sec each one of these sections has three verses. And I tell you, the beauty of the Lord, of God's sovereignty, it's, 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 it's outstanding. But again, you have to put Psalm 2, Psalm 24, and Psalm 110 all together. In Psalm 2, the first three verses depict the nations, the kings of the nations, challenging God the Father's declaration to give the human race to Jesus as an inheritance. God the Father makes a stand that the inheritance to Jesus Christ is going to be the human race. The kings of the earth, the kings through history, contest that decision. In verse 1 to 3, they take a stand against God, and they are raging in anger, and they say, you cannot give the affections of the human race to the Son of God. They belong to us. We are their rightful kings. These are the arrogant, enraged kings throughout history, but these specifically, David is seeing the generation of which the Lord returns. David is seeing the generation of which the Lord returns. He has three verses for the kings. He describes the emotional dynamic of the kings through history, culminating at the end of the age. The next three verses, verses 4, 5, and 6, we have an, a revelation to God's the Father's response to the king. The Father speaks for three verses. Then we have three more verses, verse 7, 8, and 9. Jesus stands before the Father and speaks to the Father in the presence of the kings of the earth. Or in the presence of their accusations against Him. I'm not saying the kings of the earth witnessed it, but it's in, it's in the context of their rage against Him. And then verse 11 to 12, 11, 12, and, uh, I mean, uh, 10, 11, and 12 King David comes back on the scene in the fourth, fourth section and he exhorts the redeemed community, the believing uh, uh, community from his day forward to the end of the age. Three, four sections. Three verses for the kings of the earth. Three verses for the father. Three verses for the son. And three verses for King David to give practical application to the redeemed. We're going to look at the first section. We're going to do it a very abbreviated style because I want to look at this and I want to look at, at, the, at the companion passage to this, Psalm 110, which also has four sections. So I just want to give you a feel for this and push you forward in your pursuit to go study that. We don't have a chance to look at Psalm 24. The three of them go together. First, the great question, why do the nations rage and why do the peoples plot vain things? The great 
question is, why are people so given to vanity? Why do the nations of the earth spend their time and energy and all their passions on things that don't ultimately matter? That's, that's the question. Why do they plot vanity, whether political leaders, which he's talking about, or just the common people of the earth expending their, their energies and their resources on things that don't matter? First, the issue of the, of the nation's rage. There is a dormant offense in the heart of the political leaders at the end of the age that when Jesus begins to release His power, that dormant offense will come to a full rage against the Son of God. Psalm 2 describes the end-time generation. It began in David's life a thousand years B.C. It's been 3,000 years since we've had Psalms 2. But Psalms 2 is mostly about the conditions, I believe, in this generation. The political leaders, 238 nations, I don't mean there won't ever be a believing king, that's not what I'm saying. But the general attitude of the, of the political leaders of planet Earth will be rage, not a dormant offense, rage against the Son of God. It's at a time when the people are planning vanity. Here's what the kings are saying, verse 2. The kings of the earth, they're, they're, they're set in unity here. They're depicted as in a position of unity like no time in history. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. There's a coalition of the mighty nations of the earth which is already in place right now. They begin to dialogue. What are we going to do in the light of the great end time revival? And what are we going to do in the light of the great end time temporal judgments? The power of signs and wonders are breaking forth. God is raising up the Moses type prophets that speak. And the elements are impacted by the power of God and the apostles of which the great signs and wonders are taking place. The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. So there's a unity, there's a coalition. It's an unholy momentum. It's, it's an unholy momentum in the fact that since they're all together ganging up on God, they think their numbers make impact. God the Father's one vote for Jesus is worth 10 million times all of their votes collected. And they stand together and they said, here's what we don't like. We don't like the Father, the, the Lord, and we don't like His anointed, the Son of God. We don't like the anointed who the Father chose. Verse 3, let us break their bonds into pieces and cast their cords aside. God's bonds... And God's cords speak of the restraints of God's Word. They view the living Word of God as cords and bonds. Their only thought of the Word of God is legalism. When God says don't, they say, who are you to tell me don't? God says deny yourself, they say no, that's, that's legalism, that's religion. I don't want anything to do with self-denial. They view the Word of God as cords and bonds of restraint. When God views them as the way into living reality. And God's Word does restrain us. Again, this sentiment is outside the church and it's within the church as well. They view the Word of God as something negative. Something that they raise their eyes and go, well, you know that group that is like into the Word, like that's going to really make a difference. It's just a bunch of rules anyway. Beloved, the Word of God tells us to abstain from sin. There are divine restraints in the Word of God. And the kings of the earth in this liberal hour, which is going to crescendo, is going to be very offended. You're going to watch the, the different sexual uh, dimensions of society. And I don't just mean the, the gay community. I'm talking about the heterosexual community and all their little fetishes as well. They're going to rise up and say, Who has the right to tell me no in my private life according to my passions? And the Lord unashamedly says, I do. I'm the kings of the earth and my bondservants will stand where I stand. And there will be a great war that's broken, breaking out. It's going to be about the right to control the passion of the human heart. They're enraged. By the way, Psalm 2 is quoted, I think, five times in the book of Revelation. Psalms 2, this rage explodes against Jesus. That's scene 1. The curtain closes. It opens again. Scene number 2. This is what's happening in David's day with Goliath. The Philistines laugh and mock God. You think that one of your anointed servants...
can deliver us, this little David, this little shepherd boy. I believe that Psalm 2, the reality of this was pounding in David's heart as he stood before Goliath. The reality of this is what, in, what inspired the might of his heart. He saw the kings of the earth. Here's what the kings of the earth, here's their boast. The kings of the earth say, we have more armies. We have more money, more, more capital, more property, more unity than any other coalition in history. They'll boast hundreds of millions in their armies collectively. Who can stand against us? The Lord says, my word will break your nations and your armies effortlessly. And that's what the, the bond servants of the Lord will proclaim. So they challenge the Lord. They say, we don't think you have the right nor the power to give the human race to your son. Verse 4 to 6, the next three verses, God the Father takes the scene. He's at center stage. The curtain opens of the great drama. He that sits in the heavens laughs at them. Spurgeon calls it the most terrifying laugh that breaks out through the corridors of human history. God mocks them. He says, you think that your millions of armies in unity and your trillions of dollars and all the capital you own and all the new technology, you think it does anything to hinder me empowering my church and taking the earth for myself? He mocks them face to face. He laughs at them. David felt this. I mean, what an amazing revelation. This is not just uh, David just kind of, you know, fanciful kind of thinking. This is the Spirit of God has taken David into the councils of the Lord to see this. David feels the laugh of God looking at Goliath. I mean, David's not laughing with giddiness. He feels the mockery back towards the enemy that he thinks he could defeat the purpose of God. David says, the Lord, the Father speaks, the Lord shall hold the nations in derision. He's going to hold them. What does it mean for God to take them, His, little, his fingers by the, by the nap of the neck, and holds them down. He holds them with their face to the ground in derision. God does all the coalition of all the kings of the earth. God just effortlessly puts their face to the ground. I, I, I image this thing as God grabbing the back of their neck and just putting their heads down saying, you, you have no, you're not a formidable stand against me at all. And God shall speak to them in His wrath. Again, this is all through history, but it crescendos at the end of the age. Look, look, look at the next one. God the Father, that's what He's talking about, shall distress them in His deep displeasure. Beloved, have you ever read that phrase? That's going to happen in a generation. God is going to distress the earth in His deep displeasure because they're standing against the Son of God and His rightful inheritance. And one of the ways He's going to distress them is through the great plagues and the, and the disruption of nature and the breaking of economic systems in the nations, including America. The economic systems will be broken through Europe and America. The earthquakes, the storms, the death rate, the plagues are going to explode. God is going to distress the earth because of His deep displeasure that they stand against His Son and His purposes with His Son. And God says to the earth, I have already set my king on my holy hill in Zion. He says, your kingship, 238 nations, mean nothing to me. I've already chosen a king and he's already set in place. Now imagine, now imagine the spirit of revelation opening this verse to David. David sees the divine counsel. He sees the divine interaction here. Beloved, God's already set His king in His place. It's just a matter of time. Verse 7. For three verses, the Son of God takes His place in center stage. I will declare the decree that the Lord... or. Let's say that the Father has spoken to me. Jesus stands. He goes, I only live in whatever the Father has declared true about me. It's the way that we live. We live in whatever the decree of the Lord is. He says, whatever the Lord has decreed to me, that's what I take as truth. The Father has called me His Son. The Father has said to me, you are my Son. And that is my answer to you, the kings of the earth. I am His Son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Jesus says, I take the stand of intercession asking the Father 
to give me that which he has decreed. Jesus is in the position of intercession. I believe the intercession of John 17 is the highest expression of this intercessory prayer from verse, this intercessory uh, description of verse 8. Jesus is standing before the Father, postured, asking the Father that He would entirely possess the people of the earth. When it says your possession, it, God's not interested in real estate. The possession Jesus wants is the human heart. The Lord's not interested in political power. He's interested in possessing the people of the earth. There is a possession that the Father has promised the Son of God. A people that are equally, equally yoked to the Son of God. And the Father comes before the Son and says, Ask of me and I will give you the inheritance I've promised to a people you entirely possess. This is what enrages the kings. And he goes on in verse 9. Here's the Father, Jesus quoting the Father's word to him. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. There, in, the, in Revelation 19, this passage is quoted on the great wedding day. And there's three things that Jesus is depicted as doing. He's depicted as striking with His great sword out of His mouth, the Word of God. He strikes with the Word of God, the sword. The second thing Revelation 19 describes is that He wields a mighty scepter, a rod of iron, and that's, those are acts of judgment where He intervenes supernaturally into human affairs and crashes things to get the attention of the human race. Because the human race is trusting wrong things, so He's going to break them so they don't trust them, so they trust Him. And then the third thing that Jesus is described as doing in Revelation 19, He's treading, He's treading as in a, in a large vat of grapes, He's treading grapes. He's smashing the grapes where the wrath of God is poured out like wine in the earth. He's pictured as striking with the sword, shattering with the rod, and treading with His feet upon nations. Three things. One is the Word of God in power. We're going to see the great revival when God's Word goes forth in power. But the rod of iron is a very, very serious thing. Because the rod of iron, David, by the Spirit of Revelation, understands it breaks the nations like clay pots. Tornadoes, storms, plagues, earthquakes. They are the rod of iron. He will extend it out of Zion and He will cause the earth to believe in the realm of, of the eternal, the eternal things, and to identify their lives with them instead of fixing their life around temporal things as we have done so, so uh, aggressively in the body of Christ in the Western world in this generation. Jesus will break them with a rod of iron. This very passage is quoted in Psalm 110. It's quoted in Revelation 19. Jesus, David is being able to see the end of the age. He's seeing the Father and the Son interacting at the court of heaven. It's really quite an amazing scene. Because this doesn't happen in fullness to the very end of time, of natural history, I mean. You'll dash them to pieces like potter's vessel. Beloved, this is not just poetry. This is prophecy. The Son of God, the uncreated God who became a man, will dash the nations like an iron rod hitting clay vessels. It's real. Why? Because they are resisting Jesus, the Father's claim to give the heart of the people as Jesus' possession. And Jesus wants the Father's inheritance because the Father has declared it's His. Now there's three responses. David says, be wise, O kings. Be instructed. He goes, listen with the spirit of revelation. I tell you, David's revelation is it's amazing that he's tapping into this. And he describes three responses in verse 11 and 12. He describes the people who have the fear of God, trembling with fear, rejoicing and kissing. It's a people that tremble before God, a people that rejoice before God, and a people that kiss the Son. And David understands the inheritance that God is after. The inheritance that God is after is a people who tremble in the fear of God, who rejoice in the gladness of God, and who kiss the Son in the embrace of intimacy. You know, lots of, of, uh, a lot of the people of God typically pick one of those three. There are whole camps in the body of Christ and denominations or or, or associations, whatever, you know, there's many names for it, that are really into the fear of the Lord. 
There are the holiness streams, and there's many types of holiness streams. And typically, the fear of the Lord streams don't rejoice. Then there's the rejoicing streams, which is typically been identified with a lot of the charismatic different expressions throughout the earth. But a lot of the rejoicing people don't tremble in the fear of the Lord. And then there's through history those few movements, the Puritans, the uh, monastic movement of the Catholic Church, Quakers who were into intimacy. They were into adoring the Lord. A number of different versions of that through history. They would kiss the Son. But God wants the people who tremble, a people who kiss and a people who rejoice. He wants all three of them in the same human heart. That is the possession that God has described that He's given His Son. Verse 7 just strikes me. That David on the earth, possibly while he's just a young boy shepherding sheep, by the Spirit of God, after, Saul, after Samuel's prophesied, the Spirit of Mike comes on him, the veil is lifted. He sees the interaction of the Godhead in the mystery of the Trinity. He sees them talking. This isn't just his imagination, just writing some thoughts that came to him. He actually sees by revelation the interaction of the uncreated Godhead speaking with one another about the end of the age. What a fantastic psalm. I just want to alert you to it. The psalm is far bigger than a few minutes on a second session here. Psalm, turn to Psalm 110. Psalm 2 has been a favorite of mine for many, many years. Psalm 2 is a psalm that you could spend many years enjoying and living in the fruit of it. Psalm 2, the raging of people against the counsel of God, the disdaining of the Word of God, the false confidence, because they have this growing unity of people giving agreement and consent. And they think they will stop the Father's purpose with the Son of God to have a wholehearted people. Beloved, I see the same trend in the church. I remember talking to a group of leaders one time. And I said, there's an unholy momentum in the church right now that holiness and radical commitment and abandonment to God is kind of like seems a little extreme and foolish. And a lot of leaders are gathering together and just kind of like, well, you know, we've got to be practical. And I says, let me tell you, Ian, I don't care how many leaders gather, God will have a people that tremble, rejoice, and kiss the Son of God as the full possession of Christ Jesus. There's an unholy momentum in the church even now that is kind of like, let's kind of, let's, let's be reasonable, let's keep our cool, let's not overdo this thing. That momentum has no staying power because God the Father looks at it and He laughs at it. He says, you think that any group of religious or political or any group of leaders can stop what I have promised my son? It's foolishness. Let's, let's camp on the side of the Lord. There will be a people who tremble, rejoice, and kiss the sun with all their hearts. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Very, very graphic psalm. Again, these are the things I believe were pounding in David's heart. With, I don't say he wrote these psalms. He had pinned them at this time. But I believe these were the revelations that began to unfold to him as he was facing Goliath. As he stood, the Goliath standing is a picture of Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. There's four different movements, four different sections of this psalm, and it's depicting the reign of the Messiah. Verse 1, which is part 1, the sovereign reign of Jesus. The sovereign reign of Jesus. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. What a fantastic sentence. By the way, I mean, every word of there is loaded. By the way, Psalm 110 is the most quoted passage from the Old Testament in the New Testament. Thirty-three times Psalm 110 is quoted. The second most quoted passage in the New Testament is Psalm 2. Psalm 110 and Psalm 2 were the, were the portions of Scripture, not just Psalms, they were the, uh, counting all of Scripture, they were the portion of Scripture the Spirit of God drew the apostles to lay down His doctrine from the Old Testament, from the revelation of David. Stuff is magnificent. What's going on in Psalm 110? Jesus is about purchasing the inheritance of people He will fully possess. He's come to the earth. And after He has been offered up on the cross as a, sin, a sacrifice for sin, 
He's been buried in the grave, raised from the dead, and ascended back to the Father. This passage is describing it's the first description, or it's the description of the first interaction of the Godhead. Jesus now has re-entered the court of the Father. I mean, it's, it's so it's so dramatic. Jesus is standing now in the court of the Father like He did from the days of old. He's re-entered. He's come back up. He's come home. But this time He's different. He's come home. He's a human now. It's the first time He's standing there as a human being, fully God, fully man, in the court of the Father. He's just come off of the hostile ending on the earth. Of course, we know it was the wrath of God that crushed him as a sin offering. But the whole human race, I mean, the whole Jewish race and the Gentiles as well, they turned against him. They were hostile towards him. He's just now ascended out of the grave. Psalm 24 describes the ascent of Jesus into the court of God the Father. It's fantastic. I mean, David, what, he had some serious revelation. The Lord, that's God the Father, says to my Lord, David is speaking, he's talking about to my, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's what the Hebrew word doesn't mean, Father, I'm, I'm just giving you which persons of the Godhead. The Father says to Jesus, the Messiah, David says, God the Father says to my Lord, G David knows that his son, his descendant, a thousand years later, is actually his Lord and his King. David, by the spirit of prophecy, is calling his great, 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 great grandchild, the son of David, the king of all of history, the king of the universe, a human being. He's my Lord, David says. He's far greater than me. He goes, I've seen him ascend. And I saw, I saw what the Father said to him when he stood in the court of God again to receive his inheritance. It's fantastic. It's the first event, says the, as the human Jesus comes to those joyful moments of reunion back to the court of God, returning to the Father's courts. David is witnessing what John the Apostle develops further in Revelation 4 and 5. John the Apostle, I, I make those two guys uh, counterparts. I mean, I don't make it. I mean, I understand them as counterparts is what I mean. In my understanding, David is the John of the Old Testament. John is the David of the New. The two of them are just walking in parallel lines. They're commissioned, they're calling the way that they think and feel. David, in Psalm 2 and Psalm 24 and Psalm 110, is seeing what John the Apostle saw in Revelation 4 and 5, where the throne of God and Jesus comes up to take the scroll out of the Father's hand. It's the same, I believe it's the very same court scene of the ascension. David's permitted to witness this. Can you imagine this? And he's permitted to give us a report of it in seed form. Again, John the Apostle develops it. It's, it's the coronation service. But remember, it's not just Jesus, the uncreated God, fully God alone. It's Jesus, fully man as well now. It's a whole new thing now. It's a whole new situation. The Father looks at him. And he says to the Messiah, to David's Lord, he says, I want you to sit down at my right hand. John develops, which I, I don't have time for right now. John develops the, the issue of the scroll in the Father's hand, the unfinished business about human history being brought as the inheritance of Jesus. John adds the part, I guess I am doing it a little bit, all right. But John adds the part where Jesus comes and takes the scroll, the, the responsibility to execute the remainder of God's earthly strategies and plans for natural history. That's a part of the coronation service. When Jesus is permitted to sit again, He ascends to sit at the Father's right hand. He has to take the scroll. He has to assume responsibility as the only qualified one to finish and execute the Father's strategy, bring it to its completed end, which involves the end-time judgments in the administration of history. Anyway, that's the court of the Lord. And David sees Jesus as standing. The, the, the scene is so different because... Just a few days earlier, just three days earlier, the hostile crowds were crying, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Let His blood be upon us and upon our children, is what the Jewish leader said. Let His blood be upon us! Crucify Him! Three days later, here's the God the Father pronouncing in front of all the angels, Sit in the throne prepared for you, my Son, fully human. Come and take your seat at my right hand 
in the eternal throne. I mean, it's the most majestic scene you can imagine. Three days earlier, he was bruised by the Father as a sin offering. He was despised and rejected of the human race. Now he's adored by the angel, the seraphim. Holy, holy, holy in Revelation 4 and 5. All the saints are gathered around and the Father commands him to be seated. I want you in a position seated at my right hand. Beloved, this is the Father's decree. The kingship of Jesus is settled forever by the one vote of God the Father. I don't care how many men get together. The Father has already seated the Son at the court and the scroll has already been taken. Fantastic. Jesus in His earthly ministry... See, this was written a thousand years before Jesus' earthly ministry. And of course, Jesus witnessed the, the Spirit of God telling David. Jesus was there when the Holy Spirit first told this to David. Jesus, all the time in His earthly ministry, He knew He would be enthroned, and He knew there would be a coronation service that His Father would orchestrate. And when men tried to take Him by force to make Him king when He's doing all the signs and wonders, in John 6.15... The, a lot of the common people wanted to make him king. He looked at them, he refused them, and he said in his heart, My Father will enthrone me in just a little bit of time over everything created. No, thank you. I don't want you to, to put me in as king and to think that you have the power to make me king and then the power to stand against my kingship and to vote me out of office. He says, No, thank you. I've already been promised a throne. And the coronation day is three days after my death, after, in the ascension. When I ascend, I will be seated. In all of his three and a half years, he lived in the full knowledge of the enthronement day, the coronation that was coming after his resurrection. And David, he can look into this. Isn't this magnificent that he can see this? The seating of Jesus. He's, he's ascended to the throne. And the Father now invites him to take a seat before all the angelic hosts. Fantastic. He was made Lord in Christ. You know, in Acts 1.9, it says that Jesus appeared to them for 40 days. After the resurrection, He appeared to them for 40 days. He spoke of the things of the kingdom. And you know what Peter did on the day of Pentecost? He quoted Psalm 110. He quoted Psalm 110. He quoted Psalm 2 as well in Acts 4. Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 in the very beginning of His apostolic ministry. In essence, Peter says in Acts 2.38, 2.36, The Father has made Jesus Lord. And Christ. Very, very powerful. What Peter was saying is, by the Spirit of God, he says, the human Jesus is now made, is sitting at the throne that King David talked about in Psalm 110. The human Jesus, fully God, fully man, is seated. He goes, God has made him Lord. That's what it means by made Lord. He's been enthroned and coronated as king over the human race. He says, I'm not worried about Caesar. There's already a king that's already been established. The preaching of the gospel really is the proclaiming of the Father's decree about the supremacy of Jesus and how the forgiveness of God can bring people into unity with it. The preaching of the gospel is not trying to uh, persuade people to do certain things. It's declaring the supremacy of Jesus and His tender love to bring them under it and to forgive them for the guilt of the sin that they've committed against Him. Okay, so Jesus, David sees Jesus depicted as sitting. Now, some uh, commentators think this sitting means he's sitting in activity. No. He's sitting as a judge sits when the court is in session. He's sitting to administrate justice. He's sitting when the court, when the judge comes in, the court is in session. Jesus is in His earthly, his, in His heavenly session. He's ruling right now, but He's not manifesting the fullness of His power. He's sitting like a king sits when his cabinet is in session leading the affairs of the nation. He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. The Father said, sit. Take your rightful position of honor at my right hand. That's the highest position of power imaginable. When Jesus quoted this right in his trial before the Sanhedrin, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 64, Jesus said, the next time you see me, I will be seated at the power of God from on high. 
Matthew 26, 64, and the next verse, they called it blasphemy. He deserves death because Jesus said, I am the man of Psalm 110, verse 1. And they knew it. That's the most famous psalm, Psalm 110. Martin Luther called it the, the, uh, the crown of all the psalms, the crown jewel of all the book of psalms. I mean, it is clear, again, it's the most quoted passage of the Old Testament. It is clearly the major statement of the Messiah from the Old Testament. Jesus said, I will sit at the right hand. In other words, they all knew the Jewish scholars of that day, which the Sanhedrin were the scholarship. He says, I am the Lord that King David prophesied. And they said, you are blasphemy. You are a carpenter from Nazareth. You are not the Lord, but the sovereign God will let you sit in His presence. He goes, yes, I am. That's who I am. I was seated with Him from eternity past, but I am being reinstalled as a man over the divine creation. Beloved, this is profound. The highest position of honor. But seated at the right hand, it's more than honor. It's more than just the Father's delight. The expression of the Father's approval. He would be seated there. It's full partnership. This is amazing. The Father is not going to administrate anything in the eternal kingdom without this man's full participation with Him. This is the God of Genesis 1. This is the Father from eternity past has so exalted the human race to take one from among the race of human beings. He says, you are seated at my right hand. No counsel will go forth of which your signature is not on it. From now on, forever, 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 a man will bring his counsel into the Godhead because he's fully God as well. The, the ramifications are staggering about God's desire for the human race to exalt it in the grace of God. David is seeing this a thousand years before Jesus came. I mean, his, he's seeing what John the Apostle saw in Revelation 4 and 5. It's, it's staggering. Every detail of the Father's administration Jesus signs it. But it's more staggering than that. Because Revelation 3.21, the very last word Jesus ever spoke to the church. Revelation 3.21, on the island of Patmos, He tells John the final word. He says, when they overcome, they will sit with Me on My throne as I sit with My Father. Jesus goes right back to Psalm 110. And He says, My bride will sit with Me. My bride will sit with Me. Do you guys know who you are? Honestly, no, I'm, I'm, I'm being as serious as I can be. Do you know what a redeemed human being is? Jesus says, the Father won't do it without my signature. And I won't do it without your signature. You are my partner forever. Co-heirs. That's unthinkable. Romans 8, 17. Co-heirs. Two signatures or the check doesn't work. Co-heirs. Beloved, I know we're struggling. All of us got pain and struggle, but there's something bigger going on that you're a part of. This is really who you are. I know this is... This is like our brains go, what is going on? Jesus then, the Father announces, He goes, I want to tell you something, Jesus. Every one of your enemies will be manifest as defeated. They'll be brought before your footstool. They'll be manifest as defeated. Every one of the hostile voices three days ago will bow before you in manifest defeat. Every one of them. Every one of them will be defeated. Jesus quotes this psalm. I just told you in Psalm in Matthew 26, that was the second time. He really quotes it in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the last week, the final week, in Matthew 22 as well. In Matthew 22, verse 42, he quotes this psalm. And we don't have time to develop the implications of him quoting that. But it, it's, it strengthens his heart as he's finishing his public ministry. He ends his public ministry with the parable of the bridegroom. He says that a great king that is arranging a wedding for his son. And then he prophesies, you shall love the Lord your God. There will be a people wholehearted. And then he quotes Psalm 110. Every enemy of God will be defeated. He's saying that the people will be lovers of God and every obstacle will be defeated according to the oath of God the Father. I didn't expect you to follow that because if you haven't studied Matthew 22, that won't mean a lot to you. But Jesus quotes this as the final paragraph of His public ministry before He goes into private with His disciples. This is the final quote, Psalm 110. The victory is sure. And then a couple of days later before the Sanhedrin, He quotes it again. He quotes it two times at the very end. 
Psalm 110. Jesus was there when the Spirit told David originally. Jesus was really giving veiled threats to the Pharisees. He says, every enemy will be defeated. He says, every enemy will be brought down. Three days later, he's in the court. Jesus is all but telling them, you're gambling with your life. My Father has made an oath to me that every knee will bow. Every single enemy will be brought down. Beloved, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Part two, the spiritual reign of Jesus. Part one was the sovereign reign of Jesus. This is the spiritual reign of Jesus, verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 and 3. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. And the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. Again, every phrase is so full we don't really have time to develop it. God the Father is going to send out the rod of His strength and He will rule in the midst of His enemies. This is, again, this is the rod of strength from Psalm 2. Remember the rod of power that shatters? These are divine interventions that manifest His, his judgment against the things that oppose Him. The rod of strength is different than the sword of His mouth. The sword of His mouth is the Word of God. The rod that shatters the clay vessels is the divine interventions that break things and manifest them as, as temporal and as weak before Him. God is going to send forth the rod of His strength out of Zion. Ooh, that's, Zion is heavenly Zion, but Zion is the church. It's going to be men and women likened to Moses speaking, and the rivers will turn to blood. The rod will come out of the midst of the people of God. It will come from a divine authority from the throne of God. God will use it through His people out of Zion. The rod of strength will be loosed by the people of God. But let's look at this phrase, he will rule in the midst of his enemies. What an amazing sentence. It's a very, very mysterious reign. Because any king in David's day as well as throughout history, every king always destroys their adversaries within the kingdom. I mean, there's, the history is filled of the stories of the mass slaughters. I mean, Adolf Hitler had a whole gang of guys that helped him get in power, and something threatened him. He killed all of them in one night, had them all murdered. I mean, hundreds of them in one night. Kings have done that through history. They never, ever let even the thought of an adversary survive. But Jesus begins His rule at the ascension and has let His enemies continue in the midst of His rule. It's a very mysterious reign. There's nothing like it. No king ever lets the enemies live. No king does. Any enemies that are, have any kind of profile at all, He's the only one. It's a very mysterious reign. Like his, his priesthood, according to Melchizedek, verse 4, is very mysterious. Everything about him is hidden and mysterious. David's looking at this a thousand years. He goes, it's going to be different because the enemies are going to, are going to reign in the midst. I mean, he's going to reign in the midst of his enemies. A totally different paradigm of the kingdom of God than the Old Testament had at that time. Because in David's day, like in Moses' day, the enemies of the law of God were executed when they broke the law of God. Within the commonwealth of Israel, nobody could break the word of God and live according to the ideal. They were to be executed, capital punishment. The enemies could not live inside the camp. But after Jesus came, David's prophesying a new order of the new covenant. He says, no... In the reign of Jesus, the people of God will spread worldwide. Matthew 28, He will send them to the nations. Matthew 10, He will send them among wolves, as sheep among wolves. He will send them among the enemies. The reign of God, the power of God, won't be like in the camp of Israel in the Old Testament where they killed the people that disobeyed. They were going to go and live amongst the enemies and the power of God would break forth in measured ways amongst the enemy nations. And God had two reasons, at least two reasons for doing that. Number one, He was going to convert the enemies to become lovers of God. He was going to invade the camp of the enemy, and He had so much confidence in His power, He would take Saul of Tarsus, breathing threats and enmity against God, He would turn him around and make him a radical lover of God. He knew that in the enemy camp, He had the power in His beauty to convert men voluntarily and to convert women, that they would be abandoned to God, even the enemies of God, He knew He could win them. Secondly, He knew that those that were not converted, He would train His people in love through the pressure of the enemies. 
It's a very different kingdom. He wants to convert the enemies. He knows that he's going to get a whole host of them. And those that he does not convert, he will use them to train the people of God as voluntary lovers. So his rule is in the, deliberately in the presence of enemies. It's a very, very unusual thing. He's going to give the enemies a chance to repent. And then those that don't, he's going to use them to create an environment of mature love to grow in the midst of the people of God. David is saying, this is really radical. This is really, really new stuff. He goes on to say in verse 3, the focal point of why the enemies are going to be allowed for a season. Again, we know it's just uh, several thousand years, ever, you know, 6,000 years of human history, whatever. But 3,000 years after this psalm is written, here's the point. Here's the focal point that David got a hold of. God wants volunteers, voluntary lovers. At the end of the day, God wants, he's going to bring everybody beneath the feet of Jesus. There's, there's a, a declaration of mandatory obedience. Every single demon and angel, every believer and unbeliever, are, is under the declaration of mandatory obedience. But God says, out of the midst of former enemies, I will bring forth voluntary lovers. God wants voluntary lovers of God. David understood God's plan was to bring voluntary lovers out of the remnant of the human race. Even back a thousand years B.C., three thousand years ago, David saw the paradigm of voluntary lovers. That's what God was after from human beings on planet Earth. It's magnificent. He says, your, pe your people shall become volunteers. They shall volunteer freely in the beauties of holiness. Now he's talking about the love of the people. He's talking about the beauty of God transforming them and making them voluntary lovers. And this is David's ultimate picture of the people of God in the beauty of Jesus as lovers of God sharing the reign of Jesus with Him forever and forever. It's a fantastic picture. But there's going to be a time called the day of God's power. God has, has given uh, little uh, uh, momentary power surges through church history called revival. The first power surge was the book of Acts. The first one was the day of Pentecost. It lasted for a little bit of time. There's power surges that move on people's hearts and they become so tender, they grow in voluntary love very, very quickly. And under revival, voluntary love grows quick. Especially when the enemies are pursuing and creating this dynamic where lovers are under pressure from the enemies and they grow in love even quicker. God is going to bring forth voluntary lovers in the beauties of holiness. I, I was, I've got a, a, a set of notes. I haven't shared it yet. Twelve different aspects. I'll share it undoubtedly pretty soon, one of these days. But... Uh, Twelve distinct aspects of the beauty of God in the life of the redeemed, in the, in the eternal plan of God. Twelve ways in which the beauty of holiness is imparted to people. Twelve distinct ways. David sums it all up plural. The beauties of holiness and voluntary lovers. He says that is why God is allowing the enemies to, to, root, to reign, I mean to continue for a while, for a few thousand years, so that he can make them voluntary lovers, and then he can use the enemies to cause the voluntary lovers to mature through pressure. Then he talks about the mighty scepter, the scepter of strength. Again, we've talked about that. He talks about the phrase that from the womb of the morning, from the womb of the morning, or he said there's going to be the breaking of the day. It's very poetic language. It's used a number of times, in, in, a couple times in the book of Job and several places in Psalms. It speaks of the new day. There's a, a new day that God will give His people when He brings them and ushers them into the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning, from the dawning of the new day. Put that phrase, the dawning of a new day. Individually. Lamentation says God's mercies are new every morning. There's, a, there's the womb, there's a birthing in every new day into the beauties of holiness if you want it. Individually, the mercies of God are new every single morning. You sin today, you go to bed in pain, you wake up tomorrow and the Lord says there's a new beginning. If you want it, you have it today. From the womb of the morning, from the light breaking forth, there's the birthing of new possibilities of life in God if you want them. The beauties of holiness, the power of God can be yours if you want it every new morning. And then there's the womb of the morning, the age to come. Or even in a secondary sense, the different 
seasons in church history, new beginnings. This new beginnings principle can be applied in many ways. The womb of the morning where there's the birthing when the new light comes. Beloved, when you get new light, when the morning light begins to break, the darkness of the night, the new light brings new possibilities of new life. The birthing, the womb of the new light. Some of you are sitting here tonight going, man, I'm gone. No, you're not. You're not. It's not over. There's new light coming for you. Even tonight, some of you get new light. There's a new birthing for you now if you want it. And of course, in the most ultimate sense, at the, at the end of natural history, that's the big sense of which the new light, the Son of God, comes as the light. And it's the new birthing of a whole new order of human experience. The phrase there, you have the dew of your youth. Speaking of Jesus, of that there's, there's five or six, seven, eight different ways to look at this. I mean, they all say the same thing. I mean, the imagery of dew has so many elements to it that we can draw comparisons from. But it means, at the end of the day, it means in the vigor, the eternal vigor of Jesus. He has, he has the dew of His youth. He is eternally in the vigor of youthfulness, Jesus is. Song of Solomon depicts Him that way. Oh, well, lots of passages do. Part of the beauty of Jesus is He is et eternally invigorated as a youth with full energy. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the main imagery meant there, the freshness of youth, the zeal, the energy, the vigor of youth. The, the imagery of the dew, because the dew, there's 10 million dew drops, or 10 billion of them, is talking about uh, uh, many commentators would, would uh, go with the, the imagery speaking of the multitudes of those that God is bringing in His kingdom is like the dew that covers the earth. Every single little dew drop glistens and reflects the sun's light. And it's just the imagery of multitudes, each one of them individually reflecting the glistening sun that comes from Jesus, that speaks of the dew drops of the Lord over the earth. He uses them in the beauties of holiness. Anyway, there's many different... Uh, uh, comparisons to be brought forth from the word the dew. But the dew of his youth speaks of the fact he never ever grows weary of this thing called loving the church. And the beauties of holiness, the beauty of Jesus is that he had the dew of his youth forever and forever and forever. David was just gone. He was in, so in love with Jesus. He said, oh, you never grow weary. Oh, the beauties of holiness. I am a voluntary lover. Oh, I see you seated Oh, after a hostile time on the earth, at the coronation, you're enthroned, but you're seated at the right hand of God the Father. He goes on and on. Verse 4. It's the third part of the psalm. I'll just end this quickly here. For time's sake. The priestly reign of Jesus. Verse 4. This is startling. This is confusing. This is bold. David talks about this king who will be a priest like Melchizedek. Number one, no one who's a king can be a priest. Those offices can never, ever be mixed. There was only one man in Jewish history of which the office of king and priest was ever mixed, and it was in King David's life in only a very, very minimal way as a picture of Jesus. A king and a priest can never, ever mix their offices. It's impossible. When David first sees this, this throws him off, undoubtedly. He goes, a king who is a priest? He goes, wait a second, 1 Samuel 13. Saul was rejected as king because he offered a priestly sacrifice. Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26, he offered a priestly sacrifice, the king of Israel, the king of Judah rather, and he was rejected, he was struck with leprosy. No king and priest could ever mix roles, and there's many reasons why, but God tells David a thousand years ahead of time, there's coming a king in whom, as a human, all the nations will bow before Him. He will sit in the court of God the Father. He will impart the beauties of holiness. He will have the vigor of His youthfulness all the days of His life. He will have a sword that breaks everything. And he said, but he'll be a priest too. And David thinks, well, Saul did that, but this is the Lord. This is bold. This is startling. This is contrary to Scripture, if you will, at the time. David says that there's coming a king who will be a priest. It's a new era coming. It's radically different. He's made. He's the only priest that is at verse four that has ever been made a priest by divine oath. God swore a solemn oath that Jesus would be a priest that God the Father would honor His 
intercession for us forever. God swore it to him. He says, forever, I vow to you, forever, you die for them. I vow to you, I will always honor your death and keep them in the fullness of my presence. I swear it to you, Jesus, if you do it with an oath, he swore to the Son of God. David saw the divine oath that, that made Jesus' sacrifice valid forever and forever and forever. It's based on an oath. No, pri no priest was ever given a priesthood based on an oath. It's a different kind of priesthood. It goes on forever and forever. The priests of David's day, they were, limited, they, they were limited by old age or by physical death. But there was coming a priest that 10 billion years from now his sacrifice would hold true and keep the guilt of former sins off of us. It's fantastic. David was absolutely going just absolutely besides himself forever. The point of it is, is on the last day when the wrath of God breaks forth, you and I by the oath of God can stand guiltless because of the priest who stands as advocate for us. He's a king, but he's a priest too. Fantastic. He'll stand by us. He'll stand by us in the day of wrath. Beloved, you need a king. You need a king to protect you from all the enemies of God. You need a king to guide history. We need a king that has wisdom, discernment, provision that can defeat all the enemies. But we need a priest too. We need a priest that can forgive us, that can bless us, that can cause the benediction, the blessing like Jacob on his son, that can impart the favor of God by his blessings. We need a priest, not just a king, because a king can provide, a king can conquer, a king can direct. But if we're guilty criminals, that king will crush us. But he's a priest too. He comes and he pronounces blessing and favor. He pronounces the curse is gone, forgiven. There's a new day every day in the womb of the morning. Just absolutely besides himself. To rule. Then verse 5 to 7. The fourth part. His judicial reign. His judicial reign. The Lord is at your right hand. He will execute kings in the day of his wrath. The Lord is at your right hand. I believe that, Jesus, that uh, David is speaking to Jesus. He's saying, the Lord is at your right hand. Jesus is the one at the right hand of God the Father, is how I mean to say that. And Jesus shall execute kings in the day of His wrath. That's, that's really the book of Revelation. Revelation 19 quotes this passage, this whole thing. He will judge among all the nations. Beloved, the end time judgments are so sure. Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. All of these things are being declared on the coronation day when Jesus ascends after the resurrection. He will fill the places with dead bodies. The nations of the earth will be filled because He's going to use the rod. He's going to execute the rebellious of the earth before the day of eternity begins. That's a, that's a, that's a theme the church doesn't really know much about. There's 50 plus passages in the Word of God that declare the Lord's execution of the nations before the second coming. Tremendous plagues and judgments loosed by the rod of power. Listen to what it says in verse 6. He will execute the heads of the countries. He's going to he execute the kings of the nations. He's going to cause plagues and judgments to break them in one moment. Remember Psalm 2? David was caught up in Psalm 2. He said, these kings think they can stand before God. He says, I tell you, by the Spirit of God, God will break them in two in the great day of His revival at the end of the age. Again, this is, has little manifestations through church history, but it comes to a, fr a fruition at the end of the age. And he shall drink by the brook of the wayside. Therefore he shall lift up the head. Or lift up his head is the idea. It's a strange, seems like a strange way to end it. He shall drink by the brook, by the wayside. David is speaking a military language. And the number one reason, well not the number one reason, but a main reason why a king would be hindered in battle in David's day because the kings would be pursuing a nation they're defeating, but they would outrun the water supply. Because they didn't have water supply like we do now. They had to stay within proximity of water, because in the heat of the battle, their thirst would become raging. There's four or five passages where in the heat of battle, the soldiers were raging with thirst. I mean, uh, Samuel says it. I mean, uh, Samson says it in Judges 15. He, the power of God comes on him. He kills all these men. And then he says, God, I've killed them all by the power of God, but I'm raging with thirst. I'm going to die if you don't give me water. 
And, and that happens a number of times, the issue of water, because in the pursuit, they outrun their water supply. That's, that's a very, very real reality to David as a military strategist. But this is not so with Jesus. As he goes on, there will be no human limitations. He will have continual refreshment. And everywhere that he goes, it will be by the perfect strategy of the Father. He will be refreshed. There will be no delays because of human obstacles. That's the imagery that he's speaking through military language. Everywhere that he goes, there will be a fresh brook to refresh him. He will not lose any of his vigor while he's defeating the kings of the whole earth. One of the main military strategies of history is you never ever fight a battle on two fronts, never. Napoleon in the 1800s, early 1800s, fought a battle on both fronts and he was conquering all of Europe and he had a battle on two fronts, on the east and the west, and therefore he lost. Adolf Hitler comes a hundred years later plus and he says, I will not do what Napoleon did and after a year or two in the World War II, Two. Hitler gets on two battle fronts and he's broken because he's on two battle fronts in the human arena. Obviously he's broken because the Lord broke him. Jesus Christ will be on a hundred battle fronts but not at all depleted in his energy. He will conquer every nation simultaneously because there will be the brook of supply of refreshment everywhere that he goes. His first coming, he was upon the cross and he cried out in agony, I thirst. I have come to the end of human resource. I thirst. His second coming, there will be no human limitation. There will be a supply of refreshment at every turn of battle and warfare that the Lord directs them. No limitations whatsoever. Kept vigorous forever. Amen. Let's stand. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.